Greg Wycamp with Edgewater Resources. Uh, with me is uh, Daryl Veldman, is our Director of Civil Infrastructure for the firm. And I'm going to hit a presentation here and we'll get started. Uh, if at any point through the process you got a question, feel free to just chime in. Um, it's uh, There's a lot to cover and uh, happy to just chat throughout the process. So, um, here. All right, hopefully you can see it, the presentation. So, we see it? all right, excellent. So, um, so this is just the, the project is called Adelaide Point. It's in uh, Muskegon, uh, Michigan. So just a quick introduction of Edgewater. So again, Edgewater Resources is a, a, a civil engineering, a marine, coastal planning, landscape architecture design firm uh, based in St. Joseph, Michigan. We also have offices in Madison, Wisconsin and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, and we work primarily on the waterfront doing all types of waterfront development, marinas, um, hospitality, residential, all those sorts of things um, all over the world, but with a lot of uh, emphasis here in the Great Lakes, of course, and in the Caribbean. Um, we do development expertise, marine expertise. Lost your audio there, sir. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh oh. Now you're on mute, I think. It it keeps cutting out automatically. I'm not sure why that's going on there. So I oh. will keep an eye on it. So um okay. all right. So again, as as I said, Edgewater Resources, we focus on on waterfront development, some marinas, master plan communities, um, engineering, um, coastal engineering, civil marine, landscape architecture, architecture. Uh, everything you need to build a project on the waterfront with a focus on you know, mixed use, uh, residential, hospitality, uh, municipal, and marinas. So um, a lot of different projects across the world. And um, we're going to start with a conversation today about, see if this will work for me. There we go. Um, you're all familiar with the Muskegon area here on the West Shore, just north of Grand Haven, northwest of Grand Rapids, uh, specifically Muskegon Lake. And our project site is right here in the middle. If you can see my mouse there, it's right here on the south shore in the middle of the lake, um, just adjacent to downtown Muskegon. Um, you're probably all familiar with a lot of different projects. Uh, the former industrial heritage of the community, the Safi property here where the paper mill was, a lot of other development, industrial development sites or former industrial sites are converting over to different types of mixed use uh, or primarily residential waterfronts. And of course, there's a lot of concerns about public access and those sorts of things. So our site is right here. Um, a little bit of a, an older photo of the site. Very specifically, the property line kind of runs between this, these two peninsulas on the east and then back and covers all this property. Um, this is the former West Tran facility. Uh, this is the former, uh, it was a steel foundry. Um, Anaconda uh, coil and wire, I believe, was down here. And a lot of industrial, most of this land that you see here is all fill from the former steel foundry activities. It's all Pigeon Hill sand from this dune back over here. So a lot of the sand came from here, was used in the foundry and was then placed in the lake as fill over time. Prior to all this activity, it was actually a lot of lumbering. If you're all familiar with Muskegon, it was formerly Lumbertown, USA, one of the highest uh, per capita populations of millionaires in the country at the time. So there's a huge legacy of lumbering and industry in Muskegon. Um, and what's interesting is, as so, so many of our other uh, shoreline communities have, have really transitioned over to more of a, of a hospitality resort style waterfront, Muskegon is coming in late to the game or later in the game. And um, our client feels like that's because he's going to come in and do it best. So doing it last means doing it best. The owner is a, a gentleman named Ryan Liesma. Uh, he owns Adelaide Energy and a number of other development corporations, uh, heavily, heavily focused on real estate management in the Grand Rapids area, West Michigan area, and also um, commercial solar. So here's the site uh, as of today. Uh, so you can see most of that boundary area here was gone. Anaconda is gone. Uh, these buildings remain and are still actively used for storage and are going to stay that way. And then we're focusing a lot of development up on this part of the site. And what's really important on this site is it's also a major public-private partnership with the City of Muskegon. Uh, the City of Muskegon owns and operates Hearts Run Marina, which includes 
the, the large boat basin, what they call the small boat basin here in this, uh, between what we call the West, Central and Eastern peninsulas. And then they also have this uh, mooring field out here. So while a fair amount of what we're gonna be showing you today is actually occurring on city property, it's all part of a public-private partnership to build this together with them. So this is a current view of what's out there today. And you can see that easternmost peninsula is, is really a kind of a junkyard. It's actually not open to the public today. It's locked off uh, for former boaters. Uh, I say former because the marina, the small boat basin has been closed for a number of years due to high water. And you can see the flood damage on the middle peninsula and the western peninsula has similar characteristics. And then you can see a lot of public access that is a publicly owned um, and dedicated grant funded uh, bike path that's part of a, a link from downtown all the way up to the beach. So that's what we have today and this is what we hope to build. Um, so as you can see it's a mixed use waterfront development with uh, residential and mixed use with commercial retail on the ground floor. This building here in the corner is, is a mixed use building that's going to help serve for boating industry with the uh, fuel dock and all those sorts of activities but also boat rentals and access and restaurant and, and community access up here. And then what's really important is when you look at all this green space is uh, some major overview of how do you get this project done and entitled um, is really a focus on uh, community access, public access and environmental restoration. So we'll go into that in a little more detail here in a moment. Um, but you know, from the client's perspective, this is the next step in the transformation of the waterfront in Muskegon. It's all about expanding access and cleaning up the brownfield. There is a number of contaminants on site, um, particularly in the water. Um, but some upland as well. And the goal is to build the most sustainable waterfront development in West Michigan. So the team includes uh, Fishbeck, who's been doing a lot of all the, I should say, all of the environmental remediation work. Uh, we're working with Roman uh, and Kirk over there. Um, they're doing an amazing job of helping us through all the brownfield issues and, and wetlands delineation and, and, and all the remediation aspects. Um, and what we have on site is all from a former industrial use. There's a lot of slag and debris, asbestos, lead-based paint and everything else. Um, a lot of soil management because most of the site north of those buildings is fill, um, but you have, uh, those buildings are quite dated and um, uh, the owner has, since taking ownership of the property back in April, has removed, it's over 200 uh, dumpsters of just trash and debris and, and, and materials out of the site uh, to clean it up and transforming those into a much higher quality boat storage facility and other other uh, light industrial uses. Um, estimated $250 million in investment and a lot of brownfield funding working with the city there and state grants and fundings to help pull this together. Um, as we talked about, it's an 1870s lumber mill and then the West Rand Foundry um, and the steel casting operations created much of the site. And just a few images here of, of kind of existing conditions. Um, again, none of this is currently open to the public. That path is owned by the public, but nothing else is. So we joke that this is the most trespassed upon piece of property in the city of Muskegon. Um, it feels like it's open to the public, even though it's not technically open. You can see some of this. There was a huge shoreline restoration project a number of years ago, but with the high record high waters in 18 and 19, most of that was lost and destroyed. Um, this edge condition is in very poor shape now. As we kind of shift around, looking to the east, you're seeing some of the buildings here looking to the south. Um, so this we call this one big blue and big white for strange reasons. Um, looking at this east basin, this is where the most contaminated sediments are, contaminated film. There's a lot of organics in here due to the very uh, slender um, width of that area. And as you can see, it's it's mostly junk and debris. There's very low quality vegetation and a lot of invasives, which we want to take care of. And then looking back, this is the small boat basin marina, uh, which has been closed for a number of years due to flood damage. And all of this, all of this area here is publicly owned by the city of Muskegon, but is not open to the public or accessible at this time. Lots of fencing, um, a small, this is a part of that uh, path. Um, bridging over a very small wetland. And then looking at the south side of those buildings, just a lot of pavement and remnants from its industrial past that will be cleaned up over time. So this is the interior of some of the buildings. This is one of the nicer buildings. Um, that's the one over here. This pad here is actually 
Um, there's actually concrete under all of that area that you see there. This is going to be transformed into another, some additional light industry area in here in terms of boat storage and boat operations. This is some of the nastiness inside the buildings that has been cleaned up. Um, and the major overview of, of moving forward, uh, when the client asked us, we started working with the client last December. Uh, his question was, is how do we move this project forward as fast as possible? And, and the conversation really centered around um, a number of things. One is making every inch of the waterfront public open. Unlike most waterfront developments these days, um, there's this idea that we can gate off the waterfront and I've got mine and you all keep out. Um, we're taking the exact opposite approach at this at this site. We're making every inch of the waterfront open to the public and stepping the residential and the private elements to the back. We're going to open up all three of those peninsulas um, to make them you know, accessible for public fishing and walking and accessibility. We're going to have the soft green habitat everywhere that we can in terms of rather than hardened uh, rock line shorelines, we're going to have we have to have some of that, of course. Uh, but wherever possible, we're putting in soft shorelines for water quality treatment and stormwater improvements. And then, of course, a lot of ADA access. Um, a lot of focus on sustainable design, um, which really focuses on a tremendous amount of solar power generation, wind power generation, uh, everything that we can think of to make this facility as sustainable as possible. We'll go into that in more detail. So here's a quick overview of the master plan. Um, what you have here, again, these are the existing large buildings to the south. This is big white and big blue. Those will remain. This is the only buildings that will remain. And then we have generally on the south half of the site is going to remain in somewhat of a light industrial character, probably boat storage, maybe boat sales, um, even possibly some, some light manufacturing of, of elements associated with boating. And then as you move to the main body of the site, we have a mixed use waterfront edge with a series of mixed use uh, residential buildings, all six stories high. Um, they'll be constructed of a mass timber uh, construction technique. We'll go into that in greater detail. More residential on the east side and then possibly apartments um, or, or senior housing and then other uh, residential here on the interior of the site. Uh, the site itself has a, a sort of a neighborhood character in terms of walkable street design, in terms of narrow streets, on-street parking, uh, sidewalks on all edges, minimum of off-street parking, all of the primary parking for the buildings is inside the buildings themselves. So there's covered uh, indoor parking in all the buildings and then overflow parking, uh, the smallest amount we could uh, get away with working with city planning. They actually pushed us to to take away parking um, as, instead of adding parking. We had a really constructive relationship with the city of Muskegon planning staff and it's it's uh, been an ongoing relationship for a long time and it's working very, very well. And a key here is that, again, this entire edge, all of this green space along the water's edge is entirely public everywhere. And it will be dedicated through permanent easements as public access in perpetuity. And then coming back this way, bringing out the East Peninsula, which is currently blocked off from the public, will be reopened to the public and converted into a park as part of the development agreement. Um, obviously, a major marina component. What we have is a 270 slit marina out here with a focus on um, we're going to create the harbor with a rubble mound breakwater structure and then have floating dock systems inside um, that will have 72 transient slips and a, and a broad mix of slips from from 30 feet to 65 or 70 feet inside the basin this entire edge of the shoreline here has a conservation easement um, that we are respecting and these uh, four access points are, are allowed already in the conservation easement and then moving along to the East Basin, we have a, a new lift well facility that will be publicly owned. It'll be owned by the city of Muskegon and operated by, by the developer. Uh, we'll include a, a um, 75 ton travel lift well, a boat launch a ramp that can accommodate boats up to 80 feet long. And we're actually doubling the width of this East Basin channel to improve water quality and then create shopper docks along here. A shopper dock is a place where any local boater from the community can come in and park their boat and come, you know, park here, come over and have dinner, come see the shops, go ride bikes into town and do those sorts of things with fuel and pump out and everything else this way. Um, so that's a quick overview there, quick enlargement of that plan. Again, you see a number of areas where we have residential amenities in terms of pools. So there's one on the east end here as part of this 
very public space in terms of, again, wedding venues and wedding events and restaurants and, and boat leasing. And then over here, more of a private one to focus on uh, supporting the residents. Uh, it's a key to it just I can't emphasize it enough. Uh, the public side is always the water side. There is there is no part of the waterfront that is not open to the public with a very mild perception of this hundred foot long width of the travel lift well where we clearly don't want kids playing around where there's a travel lift moving a, a 75 ton vessel. But with, with that only exception, everything else is meant to be available for public fishing and habitat creation and habitat restoration. Um, we have had near universal support for the project from Wimsor Deck, from the Muskegon Lake Watershed Partnership, from the Drain Commissioner's Office, the City Commission, uh, Planning, uh, the the um, the uh, NIMS Neighborhood Association. Uh, just I've never had a project so well received. It's been very encouraging. So some additional information about the slips. A key here with the boats and the marina is expanding access to the waterfront. And so that means creating affordable slips and many more slips. Um, but we're also focusing on creating new boater service amenities, but also boat rentals. So not everybody, of course, can afford to have a boat and have a boat in a marina. So we want to have a boat rental facilities, boat clubs that people can join for a reasonable fee, um, all the way down to renting paddle boards and kayaks for 10 bucks an hour, which, which we'd hope makes access to the water accessible to the broadest range of the community as possible. Um, also focusing on uh, ADA compliant kayak launches and those sorts of things. Uh, and that has been extremely well received by the community. Um, thinking about the shopper docks, again, that is an, an opportunity for anybody on the lake to come over on their dinghy or small boats from the residences in the area. Um, and again, a constant focus on making boating accessible to everybody, regardless of age, income, or ability. Uh, it's sort of a fundamental principle of, of design for our firm is, is to make this water accessible. And we really do focus on public access as much as possible. And I think that is probably the single fundamental key to why we've had such broad support. Um, we're already through plan commission approval and we're submitting, submitting the joint permit applications in the coming weeks. So that's been very encouraging. So here's a few images of, of what we expect the quality of the docks to be. This is a, a timber dock system that you see throughout the state of Michigan. Um, it's actually manufactured in Michigan, a company called Flotation Docking S uh, Systems up in Cedarville in the Upper Peninsula. Um, it'll have this kind of quality and character. Of course, all of the modern um, fire safety standards, utility standards, um, electric shock drowning standards. Uh, if you're not familiar with any of those things, uh, there's a whole new series of codes associated with marina design and infrastructure development um, that we, we spend a lot of time working on. So this is a key piece of the safety of the project. Um, and then a focus on how does that that boat, how does that boating interface with the water's edge and the buildings and what's the quality and character of the architecture what people want to live in this place um, we will also have boat storage and boat rack storage so if you're not familiar with with a rack storage this is designed for boats generally uh, in michigan we generally do this for boats under 30 feet in length but down in florida we just opened a facility uh, that will take boats up to 45 feet in length and what you end up with is boats in a series of racks. It's a very efficient use of space. It's also a very cost-effective way to provide hundreds of slips for smaller boats at a very affordable price. And so again, that's part of our serving the community and expanding access for boating, but also creating a, a profitable business for the developer and just getting more boats on the water. Um, accessible kayak launch facilities. Uh, again, this would be part of the public access, but also part of the, the local rental facility so that you would have right near this type of access, you'd have uh, a rental opportunity for anyone to get out here under the water. A tremendous focus on fishing. Currently the site is, you know, again, it's, it's the most trespassed upon piece of property in the Skegan Lake. It is constantly, the shoreline is constantly um, lined with fishermen in the area. We want to preserve all of that and actually expand habitat. We're focusing on some grant um, grant uh, opportunities, but also you know constructing habitat features for centrarchid species and making more accessible routes. Currently, there's no accessible routes to any of this. We want to have more of that type of access and maintain and keep um, the public fishing that is is so popular there today. 
Um, again, wherever we have the opportunity, rather than a hard shoreline, we've got the room and the space to create a softer shoreline that can move with the water levels and can, can absorb some of that energy. It's good for wave climate. It's good for habitat. It's good for water quality. This serves as a filtration edge to all of the on-site drainage, which will sheet flow across the site. Um, this is the kind of character that we aim to have. There will, of course, be some limited amount of, of rock uh, in key areas, high energy areas that we have to uh, you know, defend against the waves, but we want to mix that in with softer intermittent parts of the landscape to do the best that we can uh, to soften that edge. Um, we will have a, a, a rock, that outer breakwater uh, will be a rubble mound structure. It will have uh, wind power elements, actually um, wind power turbines uh, installed as part of that rock structure. We are hopeful that we can make the rock structure itself accessible with a path on top. Um, if we can't do that for cost reasons, we will have uh, the perimeter walk that uh, the perimeter dock that goes along the inside of the basin will be open to the public so everybody will be able to get out all the way to the end of the breakwater and kind of be out in the middle of the lake which is a really exciting thing for a lot of folks and then looking at how you start to integrate these sort of limited hard areas with soft areas and in, in sort of a mix and match approach to really focus on on having as much soft edge as possible um, as we start to think about the character of the upland spaces clearly um, it's it's a it's a high end community with high end amenities. We want to have again a public edge, a great public character, um, but with nice, clearly defined, uh, more semi private spaces, so that from a from a design perspective, visitors know that they are welcome, that they know and understand just how the site is organized, what is public and what is private. Um, so this is one very good way to do that is with this sort of grade separated areas. Um, but again, a real focus on that public edge and then having a nice mix of boardwalks that will go out over the water, over the wetlands. And we have a lot of educational uh, elements that will be incorporated as well. Again, thinking about a, a mixture of how you move vehicles throughout the site. We don't want to have, we want to have as walkable a community as we can, but we're not going to pretend that, of course, cars aren't a huge element of this, but particularly in the winter, but a mix and match of how do you get these pieces to all work together and create a really seamless waterfront environment. And then rooftop decks, uh, the roofs of all the structures will be either green roofs or solar panels or public access decks. So we're making use of every inch of the space that we can. At the ground level, we want to have a very welcoming small scale public access edge with these lower level plinths step back from the from the tire from the higher areas behind the higher structures behind. And again, just a real focus on that waterfront edge perched beaches. Um, we had an initial concept was to have a, a sandy beach that goes down into the lake um, for, for a number of reasons that is, is not currently in the plan, but we do have a number of perched beaches where the idea is you have these sort of sand play elements that during the daytime, it might be something where the kids are hanging out, but into the evening, it can actually transition into a different kind of flexible use that uh, supports the adjacent restaurants um, and, and sort of kind of nightclub activity um, to just have spaces that are really flexible and transform throughout the day in terms of their use. Uh, the, the shoreline edge treatments again are arranged from vegetation, sometimes mixed in with a little bit of breakwater, sometimes mixed in with a little bit of offshore segmented breakwater, moving up to a, a very limited use of armored revetment, and in our case, a very, very limited use of vertical steel bulkheads. I think we have, what, maybe 100 linear feet total? 100 feet. Uh, out of what, 3,000 linear feet. So a tiny amount of vertical bulkhead. We want to avoid the use of the bulkhead primarily for, for cost, of course, but also the fact that it does create a, an unpleasant wave environment with wave refraction off of that structure. So generally, we're pushing as hard as we can to stay in the left half of the diagram in, in very limited use of the right half diagram. Uh, a series of, of uh, stormwater quality uh, elements here in terms of, again, green roofs to do filtration. Um, it's actually not to our advantage on this site to hold the surge uh, of a storm peak. We want to get that water into the lake as quick as possible before the upstream water comes down, but we still want to do that filtration. We have biofiltration of all the on, on street, um, or excuse me, all the on-site sheet flows. Everything on the pavement will go through stormwater quality units and have a naturalized shoreline. And our hope is that we'll be creating a model project that'll serve, you know, as a, a sort of an example for for you know Muskegon County working with the Drain Commissioner of of how what's the best way to do stormwater quality on site uh, in a waterfront environment. 
So we'll be integrating all of these different strategies. And we have a, a nice infrastructure since I'm presenting to a crowd of engineers. So I'll hand it over to Daryl here to explain everything that needs no explanation to you guys. So <laughs> uh, the site is relatively straightforward, uh, like for with the water main elements through the site. Um, the water main needs to be sized for the uh, fire suppression systems for the various buildings. Uh, sanitary sewer, again, very straightforward for a site like this. We're going to have a lift station so that we can collect the uh, gray water and uh, shoot that gray water over to a uh, gravity portion of the city of Muskegon's uh, collection system. Uh, the big difference on this site is the stormwater management. As uh, Greg had mentioned earlier, the site is contaminated, so we uh, can't use the traditional uh, best management practices of uh, detention ponds, uh, perforated pipe, just because we don't want to flush that contaminated, uh, those contaminants out of the soil out into Muskegon Lake. So instead, we're going to have to do some storage in the pipes, and then uh, each outlet, we'll have two outlets. Uh, each one will run through a stormwater quality unit, which will... Uh, work with the drain office to make sure that we have all the proper uh, elements for that. Um, we do manage some of the stormwater runoff from the parking lots uh, through uh, bioswales. And again, trying to make that uh, interaction with the soil as minimal as possible, but yet long enough so that we can knock out the uh, hydrocarbons and silt and sediments that uh, we wanna keep on site so that we can uh, collect those and uh, dispose of those properly instead of releasing those directly out into the lake. Um, even the downspouts from the buildings will collect that stormwater runoff and run it through the system. And again, making sure that it is uh, as clean as possible for um, entry into Muskegon Lake. Um, those are the big three that we wrestle with as civil engineers, the water system, storm and sanitary. Um, Reconstructing all the West Western, that's all currently. Oh, true. Uh, the site needs a 12 inch water main, and on West Western, there's a six inch water main. There used to be back in the day a 12 inch that ran out through the uh, to feed the uh, factories in the area, but that pipe uh, collapsed, and I'm not sure what type of material that was, but uh, it's no longer an option. So we do need to. Uh, rebuild uh, West Western here on the bottom of the, on the picture and uh, make a connection point here with a eight inch main. And then on the Eastern end, we're gonna make a connection with a 12 inch water main and uh, get that whole infrastructure updated in this area for the city. And then we'll be plowing in a uh, 12 inch water main looping around through these buildings here. And then an eight inch water main running through uh, this portion of the site over here. Uh, again, with West Western, we're going to reconstruct this road. Uh, currently, it's just a sea of hard surface, a lot of uh, concrete and asphalt. And again, as part of the project, we want to reduce that uh, hard footprint and make it as soft as possible. So again, working with the city, making sure we meet their standards and try to create a small width as possible for the new uh, West Western. And then uh, also try to get... Um, uh, bike paths through here because uh, as Greg had mentioned there's going to be a recreational loop throughout the uh, throughout the site but then we've also heard from the people in the area that uh, some of them commute every day on their bicycles and they don't may not want to go out into the site and so they may want to take a the commuter cutoff the bypass the commuter bypass so uh, they would turn here and then uh, we would create a new path all the way over to the uh, Boys and Girls Club, which is located uh, to the east. And uh, we're also creating a, a parking area there right at the corner. Um, this will serve as a trailhead for neighbors to come in and park here and use that trailhead to get out to the beach and also to downtown. So this whole trail system uh, links the site to all the whole south side of the lake. Correct. And we've heard a lot of input from uh, the adjacent neighborhoods and how they're excited. Uh, to have access to that waterfront for, like Greg had mentioned earlier, paddleboarding, kayaking, uh, fishing, and uh, they're very excited as well. So the old, the whole site overlot grading, um, we're removing about 70 or 80,000 cubic yards of material uh, from the basin uh, to create the marina. 
Um, we're actually very fortunate with the existing grade. So again, as I mentioned over the years, all of this area was filled from the Pigeon Hill sand. So there's actually kind of this Goldilocks water depth we have here where it's it's just deep enough that the dredging for the basin is not cost prohibitive um, and just shallow enough that the construction of the rubble mound breakwater is not cost prohibitive. So we very much threaded the needle there. Um, but it also, we do need to raise a portion of the site um, for for fl flood considerations and we're able to spoil basically all of the material on site with nothing leaving the site with the possible exception of some of the more contaminated sediments that exist inside the East Basin. Um, so all of this is moving forward. The phasing is for this roadway uh, system to be, roadway and utility system to be constructed in 2022. And then as we start into the project, we'll start to build the residential components. So. A little bit more on the residential. We won't have any single family residential, but I have this image in here. We do have an incredible focus on solar. As I mentioned, our client is a commercial solar developer. Uh, so every building on site is going to be have, have if it's not a green roof, uh, as you see up here or a public deck, it will have solar creation. We're even looking at a prototype facility right now of putting solar as a, as a walking surface on the docks. We'll also have um, wind turbines out on the out on the breakwater they'll likely be horizontal axis turbines larger than this one but the idea is to generate um, as much renewable energy on site as we can so that's a major focus um, again thinking about public access with the decks but also dark sky lighting thinking about um, the way particularly from a habitat standpoint we want to do as much as we can to foster positive habitat for, for the migratory bird species and, and pollinators and so forth. So again, focusing on dark sky, not only for energy savings, um, but also for quality of experience. And also it has uh, less impact on migrating species and, and insect species. So it's all very positive from that perspective. Also some safety with that. Yeah, for sure, for safety. So some other members of the team, um, all of the building architecture uh, we have three different architects on the team. Uh, Edgewater Resources is doing some of the architecture. Corb Associates is primarily responsible for the residential structures. And um, Architectura is also responsible for some of the mixed use commercial structures on site. So Corb, uh, Jason Corb um, is out of Milwaukee and he is the nation's leading expert on something called mass timber. If you're not familiar with mass timber construction, it's basically a strategy where almost all of the structure is constructed of, of laminated timber members. Um, it is very, very sustainable. The building weighs about a third of what a traditional building would weigh, which means we have about a third of our foundation requirements, very low embedded carbon, uh, very much uh, the most sustainable way to build a tall building. Um, there are two mass timber structures in the state right now, both owned by the state. One's at Michigan State University, another is a DNR facility up north. Um, Corb is actually constructing something called Ascent in downtown Milwaukee. I don't remember the number of stories, but I believe it's 27 stories entirely, uh, you know, with the exception of the concrete parking deck at the bottom. Everything on the upper levels uh, is this timber structure. So it's a really beautiful uh, construction technique. You know, here's the views. I mean, this is the fundamental thing we're selling on the site is the views. This is out to the west towards Pigeon Hill. Um, and this is the original range of the architecture here. So you're seeing full width balconies, uh, again, six stories. We stopped at six stories because the current building code in the state of Michigan for mass timber limits us to six stories. There's no structural reason for that. Um, we just didn't have the, the time and energy to, to take on code revisions at this part of the development phase. So all of that you see there, that's the front. It's all a single loaded structure. So there's a corridor in the back and all of the units are waterfront facing units. So we have three bedroom units on the ends and two bedroom units in the middle. And you can get a sense of, of the character of the layout here, um, different types of units there. Um, but the quality of the building, this is the backside, hard to tell. Uh, below grade parking, of course, green walls, solar on the rooftops and so forth, as we've talked about. Um, just a sense of the character there. And the quality of the views, this is what the structure looks like um, from inside. So everything is timber, these timber beams, these timber posts, and even the roofs, the roofs and floors are these timber uh, panels. So the building is designed entirely, you know, in, in with the BIM system. And then the system is fabricated and manufactured off site with everything cut and pre-cut. And then it shows up on site and is assembled more or less like Tinker Toys. It's a really incredible building system. 
uh, has all the fire resistance and sound deadening and all the things that you like. We're able to get 28 foot clear spans um, and just a very different type that from our perspective, from a design and telling the story is all about recalling, you know, Muskegon's history as Lumbertown. So it's all about that wood material. So this is a major, major contributor to the sustainable design aspects of the project. And um, so this is Architectura. It's a firm uh, based in Grand Haven, and they're working uh, using the similar construction methodology on these other structures. So this is that multi-use building in the northeast corner with the restaurants and, and boat sales and um, rooftop gathering and so forth. And that is about it. So here's our closure. There's our, our image, and this is what we hope to build um, and have uh, a fair, a really good start on this next year. We hope to be under construction, like I said, on the road and utilities in 2022, as well as the East Basin for the launch well. The marina and breakwater would be under construction in 23, as would these buildings here. This building will be constructed next year and we'll work our way around the shoreline over the next years based on real estate demand. So that, uh, my friends, is our presentation. And this is us. So I guess we open it up to questions. I don't know how we did on time there. Pretty good. So. You did great. Thank you. I'm going to pause for a minute and let people unmute themselves and ask a question. Uh, I have a first one. Are you guys working with both Eagle and the U.S. Army Corps? Yes, sir. Yep, we're submitting the joint permit applications here probably in the next three weeks, and that will, of course, in involve a very thorough review on water quality and wave circulation and the wetland edge conditions and all that. So that process starts uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. I have a question. Does your project include mooring buoys? We do not have any mooring buoys in this. The existing mooring buoys as part of Hearts Run Marina will remain. Those are located just east, just kind of the, to the lower right of this image. Those will stay, but we're not adding any mooring buoys as part of our project. Here's a question from our chat box. Do they plan to use any pervious pavement? Uh, we have not used pervious pavement at this point. Uh, Dara, did you guys have a conversation with the Drain Commission? Well, we did, and again, it's part of that flushing the contaminants out of the soil. So we're being very cautious about that and trying to work with the uh, Drain Commissioner and the state, make sure that, uh, you know, also with input from uh, Fishbeck on that. And right now it's being discouraged to use that uh, perforated pavement on this particular site yeah. yeah i mean we love using that we've done that on some of our other projects but uh it's not a good best management project practice for uh, this project in my experience we we typically have much better success with um uh, paver units with the open gaps with the rock versus a pervious asphalt or a pervious concrete um, I just find that those tend to be more maintenance intensive and, and the performance seems to degrade. I have not used it in a number of years, but um, we've had very good success with the, you know, the unit pavers with the gaps and the, the small rock and find that that is much easier to maintain. So if we do go down that path, that's what I'd be recommending. But so far it's been, let's not filter anything through the site that we don't have to. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So keep it on the surface is what we've been asked to do. Uh, Greg, Paul Elziga, can you hear me? Hey, Paul, how are you? Good. I got on late. Um, I'm curious about the water depths. And is that breakwater all rock? And is it existing or is it new? If it's new, how are you going to build it? Sure. This is a new uh, breakwater. The water depths out there right now range between six and eight feet, I believe. Correct. Uh, it's maybe even four feet back in here. So it's basically a simple rubble mound structure where they'll have a, a core stone and an A and a B stone layers uh, for armoring. Um, and it would be basically the construction methodology is we'd like to build the breakwater first um, and then come back in and dredge out the basin on the interior. And we, of course, have a shelf on the inside. We want to take advantage of that relatively shallow depth so we don't have to put in nearly as much stone. Mm -hmm. uh, we are fortunate that there is another. So basically the way that Muskegon Lake works in this particular part of the lake is 
there's a shelf that's another, I don't know, 150 feet off of here, and then it drops off to like 40 feet of depth very rapidly. So, um, so that's that's the strategy there. And all the docks are new. And what about the soil conditions where you're going to drive the dock piling? Sure. This whole area here, these would all be new docks. We're, as we mentioned, we're currently um, proposing to work with flotation docking systems out of out of Cedarville. Um, okay. The anchorage system in there. Uh, hopefully would be uh, spud piles um, because we have a if we have sufficient wave climate protection that's a very effective way to go we may need to use guide piles we're fortunate that the subgrade materials in here is a is a very high quality sand in particular out in this area it's actually uh, really weak back in here in our first major structure unfortunately where we have to build this uh, but out here we've, we've got the good fortune that it's a lot of sand and it's very solid so um, probably, you know, just traditional you know, vibratory or, or uh, you know, pile insulation methods. So. Thanks. Hey, are, is there any plan for outside uh, boat storage or winter boat storage in here? And if so, how do you kind of plan to screen that? Sure. Um, so the primary boat storage is in these buildings that you see here. So this building here is currently used for boat storage and will remain so. In fact, they've cleaned out a huge portion of the back area here, so they probably increased the uh, indoor capacity for boat storage here quite a bit. Uh, this building is being renovated for indoor boat storage with, with racks, as we talked about the rack with the forklifts. Uh, these buildings here will likely be either indoor boat storage or possibly a boat condo, basically a man cave where you, you park the boat and you sit there and you drink your beer and you look at your boat all winter long. Um, there may be some outdoor storage in these um, in these aisleways, uh, in which case they would be screened by these buildings here. Okay. We have a, a comment question. It says, great presentation, very interesting. What is your targeted completion date? Sure. Uh, yeah, so the, the as, as I mentioned, the, the, the starting sequence right now is in 2022 is to hopefully get begin um, sufficient dredging, interior dredging, to get us with the roadways and utility infrastructure built in 2022. We want to build this lift well um, in 2022 as well, and then break ground on this first building and this building to have those open in 2023. We would then focus on construction of the marina and these two buildings also in beginning construction in 23 with the marina opening in 24 uh, and then these remaining three buildings would come online actually actually this building first <laughs> these two buildings second then these buildings would come online in order first second third and fourth based on market demand so uh, the far end of this i would hesitate to guess it'll depend on real estate conditions but i would say by 25 we expect to have uh, a sufficient part of the perimeter done in the marina basin and this aspect and of course all the roadways so ryan's found a lot of interest in this project with all the different oh, conferences yeah. and seminars he's going to correct yeah we've had huge interest in this first set of buildings there's a lot of pre-sales and that's moving very very well so that's quite encouraging it's but real estate year. is real estate we all know how quickly that can change so. do you have any um provisions planned for security between the um, the public uh, waterfront and the uh, private marina docks? Sure, the dock systems themselves will have gates. Um, you know, we design, we've probably designed 400 marinas. Uh, there really is no such thing as a secure marina because anybody willing to get wet or hop on a, on a paddleboard can get out to the boats. Um, but we will have, have access gates that limit access during, during for, for this part of the marina, would be at, uh, access controlled at all times. For this part of the marina, if that stays public as we expect it to, if we don't put the path on the breakwater, that would be a, a closed at night, but would have access during the daytime. This area over here is shopper docks. That would be open uh, all the time. And then this dock over here is part of the operation for the in-out storage for the racks. So um, we'll provide certainly reasonable security in terms of gate access. Uh, but the best security uh, for marinas really comes down to video surveillance. And of course, we'll have security on site. Here's another question from the chat box. 
How much thought has gone into parking with such a great amount of public access? Will there be associated public parking areas in addition to reserved parking for residents? Yeah, so parking is an interesting one. Um, working with the city, every conversation we've had with them is about taking parking away, not adding parking back, um, which we found really encouraging um, because we think this can be a really a park once community. So certainly the community is already accessing the waterfront using this, the trail system is already there. We're relocating the trail system, but um, they're already accessing it that way. There's there's a little bit of parking over here that may, that is maintained that they're using now. We're actually expanding some public parking over here for this peninsula area. Then we have on-street parking everywhere. As I said, the primary parking for the residents is in the buildings themselves. Um, this is the primary parking along with the on-street for this sort of public use here. Uh, in the summertime, one of the advantages that we have is, is this building that is full of boats all winter will be empty in the summer. So in terms of valet and, and sort of you know, covered parking in the winter or in the summertime, this building will be accessible to provide a tremendous amount of overflow parking. So that is a that's a strategy that should provide um, more than we need. So. Another quick question, how has lake level variance been factored into this project? Maybe yeah. not such a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, so um, we, we get that question a lot. So certainly with the water levels being at record highs in 18 and 19, but also record lows back in 13, we've, we've got the historic six foot water level range that we're used to for minus what 1.1 to plus 4.8 or so. Um, this facility is designed to have a minimum of uh, uh, six feet of water in certain areas interior and eight feet of the water at low water. So we'll be constructing to uh, LWD minus eight and minus nine in the basin and the entry channels. Uh, the design out here, fortunately with the shallower waters, the shallower the water gets when the water level goes down, the better our wave, wave climate protection systems work. So that's a real advantage. Um, and then when we think about these edge conditions, we're gonna design obviously for the flood condition that we've just experienced and then design systems with that with the planting to allow it to sort of chase the water levels as they go down. But that's a good question, so. Well, there's been a lot of good good discussion. I do have one question. Well, I have quite a few questions, but I want to <laughs> ask this one. Does the name Adelaide mean anything to the owner especially? Um, interestingly, he he actually um, he has a small home on a small island called Adelaide Island off of Drummond Island. Okay. And that's that's where that comes from. And that's Adelaide Energy and Adelaide Point. So that's what I noticed, Adelaide Energy. Yep. So well, good. I think I. One more question. Have you pictured contractor prop partners yet, both marine and architectural partners? Uh, we have not. So that is that is certainly a conversation we were just starting to have. And so part of the strategy at the moment is some of these elements are shifting over to City of Muskegon construction. We'll go through that path. Some of it will be by the developer directly. Um, but if anybody wants to express interest in that, certainly we can have those conversations and um, you know, I, I think there's a real opportunity here to work with the developer, particularly on the on the private sides, the marina components uh, and the residential. So thanks. I'm going to be greedy and ask one more question. Sure. <laughs> um, you mentioned the stormwater storage and the issue with the contaminated soils possible, um, possibly. What type of um, material are you using for those pipes? Is it going to be like Concrete stormwater storage? Well, again, we're going to be working with the drain office and see what their preferred uh, pipe material is. Um, whether it's uh, concrete or PVC is to be determined. We just haven't gone that far down the path yet. Gotcha. A lot of what you're seeing here is the, the concept. And now we need to start working a lot closer with these uh, regulatory agencies. Yes. Lots to do. I think you guys are going to be busy for a while. So, <laughs> thank you. Bye. It's a fun project, though. It's really in interesting. All the all the different elements that you're bringing together. Um, I'm I'm glad I I asked you to present today. I think we had a good discussion and a good turnout. So, um, thank you again, Greg and Daryl, for presenting and.
all the attendees on the line, I will, um, I mean, one of our board members will be sending out the PDH certificates to your emails. We will post this video to our YouTube page and we hope to see you again on December 14th. So with that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you again. Thanks everyone. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks a bunch. Thank you.